to everybody um, for being here. So welcome to the <coughs> spring 2018 semester evening of scholarship. So I hope you're at the right place. I don't want you to leave here, so you're here. I, um, I'm not going to waste any more time. And I prepared a few introductory notes that I'm going to read off because I'm so excited and thrilled that this is happening that I, I, I just need my eyes on the text. You can take that with me. All right. Where shall we begin? Glasses. Glasses. Glasses, <laughs> <laughs> y'all. All right. So how, how do I begin? Where do we begin? Um, this is somebody who has been doing and moving since always, certainly since we have met each other in 1997. Dr. Janaki Natarajan is the founding director of the Spark Teacher Education Institute for Social Justice and prepares teachers in grades K through 12. In partnership with Malvo Graduate School in Brattleboro, Vermont, Spark offers a master's in teaching. Born in Bangalore, South India, Dr. Natarajan has worked with the Sarvodaya movement in India and the liberation movements in Southern Africa. Dr. Natarajan received a doctorate from Harvard University, but, and the but is deliberate from my end and I explain that shortly, but has taught for a decade in Tanzania and a decade in China, as well as schools, prisons, and universities in the US. She's director of the Bapagrama Educational Center, a Bangalore-based school in South India, serving peri-urban poor people. The community-centered work at Bapagrama began in 1989 <coughs> and was founded on anti-caste and secular principles. Dr. Natarajan's work embodies what has been surfacing recently in more critical academic circles, and really, again, I should say, as epistemologies of the streets. These systems of knowing are visible, palpable, only by way of being intimately and willingly entangled with struggles, contradictions, and movement building work towards social but really material change. As one of her students, she was adamant, me as being one of her students at one point, she was adamant about reminding us that the ghosts of the past are always sitting on our shoulders. With the past as our compass and the future as our destination, these ways of knowing and being in the world uh, willfully examine, embrace, refuse, reject, rebuild, activate, and mobilize wholeheartedly material realities that in most places right now are not yet, but are inspired and guided by a few places that have been marked with collective thought and political clarity. Here's the significance of the but. While Dr. Natarajan started studying economic history Bryn Mawr, then con continued on to Swarthmore and received her final degree from Harvard. She did not receive any formal education before. And these individual circumstances were tightly connected to the history of that given moment or some of the contradictions that marked that historical moment in her life and in those of many others. On one side, dominant elite institutions prepared her for legitimizing and protecting the interests of the elite. And on the other side, Dr. Natarajan listened to what she has called her real teachers on the streets. People, children, elders, activists, healers, artists, who generously poured out their knowledge and energy towards creating a world that would benefit more than a few highly self-selected clan or group of people. So that knowledge and that education has been world-making and breath-giving to me and many, many others. And I'm so thrilled that Dr. Natarajan is here with us this evening. So thank you so much. Please give her a welcome. <laughs> Colleagues and fellow travelers, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. I'm glad to see you all. So many different universes in this room. I don't know how to connect to each one of them. You're all separate universes, aren't you? With your own particular experiences. And from my point of view, life seems very short. But when I was in this town some decades ago, it didn't seem short. It seemed like it was going to go on forever. 
And since the 40s, which is when my memories begin, 1940s, there have been many failures. That is, we had enormous hopes, whether it was in Angola, Mozambique, or South India, Madurai, or elsewhere. But those failures had to be translated all the time inside myself with the help of others. Many people have died during these decades on the same pathway. To name some of those ancestors, Carmelita Hinton from Hull House, Baide from Assam, William Hinton, so pour the libations to these names and others, uh, Walter Rodney, and these are people have uh, spoken words and written words, and many, many, many more. Howard Zinn, of course, and so on, that I hope that you have looked at and imbibed from. Because I think that in our lifetime, we all have what is called an inner thirst. Antaradaha, that is an inner, interior thirst, which is unassuageable. I hope, because once we think we can assuage it, then we failed. And that's a different failure, not the kind of failure I'm talking about. But I don't consider these failures because I'm full of having seen what has gone on in the decades I've been around and the decades before, an enormous zest for struggle. Because I think despite the worst actions of humans, the very horrific actions of humans, which we can all enumerate, there is intertwined with it the best experiences of humans as well, from our beginnings, whenever those were, from the goop. We walked out of it or didn't or crawled out of it. And that is the kind of um, memory that tells me and others have told me that it's possible to do something that's all that it is worth doing. What else is there to do? That is what is worth doing. So those who've been to China, of you who have been to China, do you remember hearing and Professor Yang, you'll forgive my very bad tone. <laughs> Woman, I love them. <laughs> I remember the first part. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting you remember the first part. The, ob <laughs> the, object, <laughs> the object is important. <laughs> Woman, I run men. OK, thank you. I'm sorry for a South Indian who's gone through other pathways, you know, it's, it's difficult. We love labor and we love the people. And there's something else I learned which I won't translate. Woman, I, Mautushi. You agree, Professor Yang? I won't ask you now, I'll ask you later. <laughs> Because at once we enter into political history, as soon as we say that. But anyway, being an old woman, you have to be careful with me because I might just go on and on with stories. So let us now say that you're absolutely welcome to interrupt me and yell and scream and carry on. That would make me feel something is happening. I also have to tell you that uh, I have an old woman's throat, so I tend to get dry and cough a lot, like uh, poor Hillary. <laughs> Except it's not poor Hillary, because she was responsible for Gaddafi's death. And here's the contradiction. Gaddafi was very important to us in Southern Africa 
for other liberation movements of Africa. So whether she was able to cough or not becomes a side path to the consequences of her actions. And it wasn't just about Gaddafi. I came, I saw, he died. You remember. So it's those contradictions that I really want to emphasize this evening and not allow us and our minds to escape. So anyway, water. This is from Gaza. It's called the Maya Project, bringing clean water to the children of Palestine, Middle East Children's Alliance. And I was listening to Norman Finkelstein just on Sunday. If you don't know him, look him up. And uh, this is again a political problem, a political point I'm going to make. And he was telling us that a million children of Gaza are being slowly poisoned by the water, toxic water in Gaza. And that water, of course, poisons the land, which is what is being seized. And that then creates the food, which is also toxic. And the Gazan children or anybody else from Gaza cannot even be refugees. So look at the news so that you know what is happening in Gaza, in Paris, East Timor, wherever you like. And see if the evidence from each of these places, regardless of where it is, whether the evidence is sufficient for you to come to certain conclusions. And figure out whether the criteria for those conclusions can be articulated by you and whether that articulation asks the question, on whose side? The three questions. Who owns, or manages for that matter, since we have a lot of management schools everywhere, who owns, who labors, and who benefits? Those become criteria, not just for activists, community activists, or whatever, but it is of the most important to the highest levels of quote unquote intellect. And that's my problem with the highest numbers, the highest levels of intellect. I was born a Brahmin, which is, of course, all of you were in the trees, you know, when I was, when my ancestors were writing uh, the greatest poetry and thinking the greatest thoughts. Uh, so, you realize this, right? And I have with me, or without me, my youngest little one here, whom I've not known for so many years, maybe 10, 10 15 years, who is from the opposite end of that caste system. We thought and we wrote, and if you look at what we did in the past, wrote and told the kings how to behave and gave them beyond Machiavelli, huh? and this was uh, Machiavelli is in the nursery school, um, that <laughs> how to conquer, how to behave, how to organize, while the untouchables or the outcasts or the other end, so from the, uh, from the head of the creator, comes the Brahmins, the shoulders comes the samurai, if you will, because it's the same stuff with the human species. And from here, of course, the uh, commercial people, if you like, and the eaters anyway, and legs, the laborers, and beyond the cleaners of night soil of animals and so forth. I remember speaking at uh, Bradbury Union High School a few year years ago about the caste system and so on. And so one kid piped up and said, but we have a caste system in the school. Connections, contradictions, what does this mean? What do we oppose? 
So what I have been caught up in is to betray my ancestors and become an enemy of them. And that is not only a journey for the street, but it's obviously an internal journey that goes into one's innards and chi and everything else. I'm stealing Walter's words, Walter Rodney's words. Betray your ancestors and become an enemy of them. And so when Tim Wise, you know him, speaks, he's a white man, can he speak on behalf of blacks? Can this happen? Can that happen? How can he say some of these things? He is in the process of betraying his own kind in order, as Franz Fanon says, to step into a world where we have people who question. That's all I want, he said, Franz Fanon. And Franz Fanon, of course, taught us in the fields in South Africa, whether you were PSC or ANC or Frelimo or MPLA, right? those were the lessons. Do you love the people? Do you love labor? Whose side are you on? So I ask my children in Rapa Grammar School often, do you think that, well, what do you want to be? Or we want to be, you know, um, uh, clerks or secretarial people or managers or something, a pen in the pocket. So their parents would come and you look at their hands and you touch their hands and um, they're rough, right? So they won't be, they would, many of them, of course, can't read, they're illiterate. So the question is, can they be scientists? Are they scientists? Are they mathematicians? Are they? Right. In the same school, a man came to see me once. He was tall, older, I mean, he was young, whatever, older. And, um, and he had this child next to him, and he said, Amma, look, I don't, I like this place very, very nice, so, but I don't like one thing that you're making my son do. What is it? You have this uh, practice in the school of cleaning the latrines. If you use it, you clean it, is the thing that's written on it. You'll remember when you were there, Patricia. And he said, I don't want my son to clean the latrines. Said, Why not? That is not what we do. That is not what we do. So Gandhi, of course, had the thing called, a whole movement called Bhangi Mukti. That is the end of the cleaning caste. That is, we all had to clean. And so what happened was, we, this is 1940s again, 30, end of the 30s. You dig a pit, it's about six feet deep, and you build a thing around it which is made out of uh, coconut leaves. And so you use it, you get rid of the waste from you, and then you put, put mud on it and come out and wash your hands. And then when it's more or less full, then you move it to another spot. So this then in six months will be compost, right? So I asked the children, hmm, you like to eat? Yes, we like to eat, no? Of course we like to eat. If I'm kind of banging on this, you know, let me know. He told me don't bang on stuff. <laughs> so, so, yeah, we like to eat. Well, what happens? What do you, you take your food and you put it in your mouth and it tastes good, perhaps, you know, yeah? So it go, where does it go? It goes down our throat, we chew it, it goes down our throat. And then what happens? It goes into our stomachs, mm -hmm. nice, right? Then you, you know, can you bang your go like this, you know? <laughs> okay, so then what happens? It goes down, and then what happens? <laughs> <You know? laughs> right? Amma, I can't say that. Yeah. What do you mean you can't say it? Then we go to the toilet. 
Is some of that still inside your bowel? That stuff? Is it? All of you? <laughs> Let's make sure we know enough physiology for this, right? <laughs> so, wait a minute. So when it comes out, you want somebody else to clean it. So you're not dirty inside. Division of labor. Power relations. Production relations. A material base. The material base of production human relations giving rise to a superstructure, the superstructure of social relations, identities, uh, uh, what, 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 uh, intersectionalities, uh, colonial, you know, I was trained as a sociologist, so, you know, all this stuff. What meaning do those theories, theories as explanations, have to this material life. And whether we want to change the material conditions of this life, not just for us, but for all of humanity. And what does that mean, etc. Can you elaborate on that? I will. Or you can too. Actually. But it's, um, I think probably most of the stories I'll tell will be little elaborations because I, thank you for reminding me. I was at Burn Mawr College as a, as a fresh person. And I got a D in my first Shakespeare paper. And I thought, oh, you know, I thought I could, I was clever enough to get at least something. So there was a woman, Sue, I'll never forget her, blind. She was blind, and I went to Sue, who just happened to be sitting. I said, Sue, what, what is this? So she said, read the paper to me. So I read it to her, and she said, OK. You've got to understand that you've got to think in a linear fashion. <laughs> Duh. I said, what? Linear? What is linear? So from that moment on, I had to learn. I had been, actually, for two years in a Roman Catholic convent, which is where I, I mean, not living there, I mean, I was living at home, um, but uh, to learn English. You know, so that was the, that's when the conquistadores got into my brain from your home country, when the man discovered you, right? <laughs> so, and so, I said, well, in linear, linear. So then I had to learn, if I wanted to be successful, I have to be linear. No, I have not only to be that, but I have to learn to save, to dream big, to compete. What are the other Protestant values? Nah. I forgot. What? Right? The ethic, the Protestant ethic. Right? Oh. Catholics didn't have that? Was it the Manichaean heresy or what, 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 what? Who's going to purgatory? All of this stuff that Fanon talks about and others talk about, and we all know. Even white people who are in this room will have heard the counter narrative because it's been shoved down th their throats by the anti-colonial struggles, right? whether we've internalized it or not. So I had to learn at Bryn Mawr from this wonderful woman, Sue, how to think properly in a civil, no, not civilized, we're the civil, no, what? <laughs> I keep forgetting, you know, this problematic of the civilized, but anyway, um, have to learn how to think in order to be able to get to Harvard or get to Swarthmore or whatever. Well, wait, what happened as, at Harvard? We occupied the buildings. They tear gassed us. We fought against the Population Council. And Mr. President Pugh ran out the back way when we occupied the buildings. However, we also listened to seminars from Huntington, Kissinger, 
So wait, who is on whose side? Who owns and who labors and who benefits? Who is on the side of the military? Who is waterboarded, et cetera? Now, all of this is interconnected, at least in my confused brain. And all of it matters dialectically. Just as the material base that we talked about, the division of labor, giving rise to the superstructure, that's the architecture that's in my brain. And we, in doctoral programs and all the rest of it, deal with the superstructure. Because that is where we get our druthers, where we get our pay, where we get, you know, whatever. We are not involved in production relations. In the old days, people would go and work in factories for, you know, for a few years and come back and so on. There was that some kind of mixtures. And one of the greatest things that happened was a great leap forward in China. Was, and you must read about it, William Hinton's book, Iron Oxen um, and Fan Shen, if you haven't come across those. Those teach us the dialectical relationships between the basic structure and the superstructure and what it means. Well, to tell you another story, I was involved with a three-year-old the other day, or some weeks ago, months ago, years ago, whatever, I forget. And uh, she said, oh, Patty, please, let's uh, play with blocks, OK, blocks strewn around. And said, what do you want to do? We want to build a building, big building. Oh, what do you want to build? I want to build a castle. Oh, OK. So I started building this castle. So I said, um, who lives in the castle? The king and queen. Of course, she said, I mean, how come Patti doesn't know this? The king and queen. Patti means abuela. So, Patti, so king and queen. Oh. You mean a big build? This big building? Two people? <laughs> yep, two people. I said, so we built, went on building. Oh, who's, who built these castles? People? Oh, how did they build these? Mm, you know. Okay. Built those castles brought the mud, the cement, whatever. Oh, look, can we do this? Maybe we could get the king and queen to help us build it. And then may, maybe all of us can live in the castle. It's age appropriate to talk about class struggle to one-year-olds or in the womb. And that's what Rigoberta Menchu says in her book. Speak to the child in the womb, right? What does she say? I am Rigoberta's sister and yours, clan sister perhaps. The sun was red, red hot when I was born. Little red bag, it's not in the yellow sheets. Little red bag, you know, I used to teach elementary school. So I know what you're thinking too. Round baby neck, giving heat, strength, and life. I remember my mother's voice reaching in through the skin of the womb, telling, 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 love work, love the people. Yardsticks of judgment, do you love the people, do you love work? The Altiplano was in the clouds, land cleared trees, reluctantly gave food after years of toil, but not enough, never enough, never enough for collectors of the state. Our ancient communities and collectivity is broken. And then we go on. Two friends of mine wrote imaginary letters to Christopher and to Martin, centuries apart, intertwined in history. One letter said, Welcome back to Mr. America, Mr. Christopher Columbus. 
to the luscious continent you wrongly thought was India 500 years ago after we discovered you. And this is the point, that every piece of history that we examine, and we examine what the teachers and the lies our history professors have taught us. You know that book, right? Lewontin's book. So that each of us in our universes knows what we've been taught. And so you take that out and look at it in the light and create some sense of lucidity as to what is this? What is it that I have? But we can't do that alone, you know? We can't do that alone. So who are our teachers? As Jose Marti said, who teaches the teacher? And this is a problem. So it, this kind of work that you are all involved in, and I know you are all practitioners, you work and you study at the same time, and it's praxis. But the political economy of that work is what we have to examine. And that is extremely difficult, I find. I have. Uh, a couple of poems that you know that there are, and I hope that we can actually read. I hope you will help me by reading a couple of them as we go along. And I have to be careful of time. I should stop shortly, I think. Is that true? Um, in this kind of work, which is anti supremacist work, it's anti supremacist work. I remember my parents telling me in the 40s when I was quite little, be ordinary. Sadhara, be ordinary. And that, I thank them for that present, so to speak. Uh, not that I've not had my arrogances and superiorities over time, but that rings. That rings. Be ordinary, not exceptional. I don't know what Obama was thinking about. But anyway, <laughs> he betrayed us. No, that's not true. He was never that, except he was already taught about things uh, that he, I don't know what he did with it. That's the problem, isn't it? We're revolutionaries taught by the PLO, but we don't know where to shoot, where is it should be aimed. And then we betray it join the World Bank. And the World Bank is against the people. The World Bank does not love the people. So it's a dialectical problem. It's an extremely painful problem, but it's full of delight because there's nothing else to do. Right. Who wants to be an Ambani with 40 stories, five of those stories for his cars? 128 families in India owning 70% of its wealth. Or in this country, you know the statistic, it's not just there, right? Is that what we want? What is the world we wish to see? Ask Samir Amin, and if you don't know Samir Amin, you should, an Egyptian communist who's been writing, and um, you'll know him? Samir Amin. If you don't, please do look him up because he uh, has also been, like Walter and Franz Fanon and others, a practitioner for many decades. That dialectical piece and that piece that goes to the material base and asks those questions must become hidden, must be made invisible. Because if this kind of thinking is not made invisible, then the oligarchs will be in trouble. Their running dogs and their henchmen will be in trouble. And they don't want to be in trouble. They don't want to hang separately. They want to hang together if they have to. We'll see what the class struggle brings. But they are responsible, the oligarchs, for the misery of the world. We cannot have any profit or accumulation of wealth without creating poverty. 
in the logic of the system as we have it now. In order to make that, that hidden, to make that invisible, when we look at context as sociologists, political economists, or what have you, we look at the contexts of the social reality of our lives which we count, which we enumerate, which we supposedly examine. How do we examine it? We pull it apart individually. One and two and three and four and five. Are you a man or a woman or somewhere, something, spectrum? What are you? What is your caste? What is your class? I was deliberately uh, <laughs> teasing our, my sister there and asking, oh, you must be Iyengar immediately. Because that's what happens. The identity is named. That is what sociology has taught us in political economy and the World Bank and everybody else. right? Not just the World Bank, many more other things like this. The NGOs, for that matter. Or our present politics. So we have caste, or we have race. And wait, you know the ANC and the PAC in Southern Africa? The African liberation movements, the ANC, the National Congress, they felt that what the main contradiction in the world today is capital and labor. Contradiction, capital and labor. So we should then fight capital in the form of settler colonialism of the whites in South Africa, but of the rich in South Africa. But the PAC, the Pan-Africans Congress, disagreed and said, no, wait, the, ma the face of capital here is white. So both took up arms to defeat settler colonialism and the horrendous consequences of that, whether it was the Boers, the Deutsch, or the, you know, or the British or settlers and so on, they took up arms, fought for many years, but how do we fight? What do we fight? What do we want? The theoretical theory as explanation, the theoretical basis of that for us at that time in Southern Africa, who do we fight? What do we do? Who are our, this horrible word, allies? It's a horrible word. Anyway, who are, who, who are these allies? Who are these people who are going to be with us? Um, and how is that going to happen? These were real. This had to do with blood and guts, and it had to do with who would be, who would belong, who the land would belong to. And because that theoretical proposition and the struggle over that theory was not resolved, we now have what we have in South Africa, which is underdeveloped capitalism and part of the imperial periphery. And we have that in Angola. And we have that competition with the resurgence of capitalism from 1979 in December, when I was in the village when the Deng Xiaoping's, I got your attention, mm -hmm. <laughs> Professor Young. So <laughs> when he sent uh, the proclamation, that is everybody, everything, you know, the head of the household is going to be. Divided, okay, it's begun. Within three years, the country which was without debt had 3,000 per person dollars per debt to the World Bank at that time. And there were more people homeless, and my, not homeless, but as migrant labor within that time. And I had seen the other China. So when I mention names or places to you, please try and uh, put away any connection to this person. That's not important. Because um, what is more important is really what happened and what happened and what happened in those times. This is not a subjective piece. This is a social reality underlaid by political economy. So the theories in many of our countries where they, under socialism, we still have class struggle. 
under socialism, we still have class struggle. And so the class struggle that occurred in all of these places, whether in the liberation movements or not, or after, they have now come to a point of where we have to ask Samir Amin's question, is it revolution or is it decadence? That's a new article of his in Monthly Review, if you want to read it. It's just come out this month. And it's, uh, it's also his new book has come out, A-M-I-N. You might want to look it up. Now, you have to understand that all of these people, whether it was Zhou Enlai, whether it was Mandela, Sisulu, or whether it was even Museveni in Uganda. And Museveni was... Uh, considered himself a person who understood, he was at Dar es Salaam University, understood all of this. And he was going after, I mean, to bring this country to a different place. And when he came here, he, you know, he called on me to come and see him, and he said, I'm sure, comrade, you're not going to be happy with me. And I said, why, why are you here? To, for a Christian breakfast in Seattle. Now, what does that mean? Why can't he come to a Christian from my point of view, he betrayed what he had been before because the Christian breakfast was the tie in to the oligarchs and the neo whoever conservatives and so on. Mugabe, right? Kim Il-sung, whom we met up in North Korea. He did not want his statue to face China, it faced his, the back of his statue because he did not want the confusion of the brilliant cultural revolution. He, didn't, he ran North Korea like this wonderful feudal system. And yet he was actually a very remarkable person. He was a nationalist, and we have very few of those now. So you see, those of us who are of color turn to nationalism in order to save the good stuff in our chi because it comforts us. We used to have great civilizations in the past. These fools don't know, these white fools, and they don't. So at least that I have. It's not sufficient anymore. It never was sufficient. You might want to read another book by Babu, A.M. Babu, African Socialism or Socialist Africa, question mark. And he was the home minister of Tanzania who was put to prison by Nyerere, Nyerere the socialist. And so there's a whole story about the class struggles in Tanzania, which began with the idea, the nationalist idea, of wanting to create a country where everyone would benefit. And that did occur for a while. But neither Mugame nor Nyerere had the faith in the people. How are we going to increase the productive forces in our country? We can't with just our people. We can't. So what are we going to do? What we're going to do Bhikshan Dehi, please, World Bank, give us a little bit of money. Give us this, we need investment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The story of India and its nonviolence is a whole other tale that I won't even go into. But I do want to say that given this underlying critical theory of political economy, that we have a particular in the social sciences, a particular um, task, and that is not to be um, sidelined in a sense, or at least go into that narrow pathway where we look into psychology as the answer and not the material base. It's my thinking. I'm going to decide now in my thoughts that I will not be Brahminical anymore. I'll be on the side of, 
excuse me? I don't think so. But on the other hand, and this is the problem with existentialism as a philosophy which the bourgeoisie loves, and that is to say, well, you know, if I really tell you my story, share my inner story with you about how horrible I am, let's tell each other class dialogue, interfaith dialogue, I'm an Islamophobe, you're this, you're that. Pour out the vomit, I was going to say, but let me be better. Let me pour out my internal story to you, and that will make me change and you understand me. Reconciliation of that sort means that no opposition is necessary. You decide whether you want opposition to be something that has to happen in order to create a different world. The NGOs know better than you and me. They don't want opposition. It's all about one, what is it? What is it? One starfish at, at a time, you know, pick it up. Right? Oh, when? Do you want a revolution? Are you a commie or something? So at once then, that becomes the connotation of that word rather than its political economic meaning. So we have very, very clever teachers that come from the Pentagon and from the Rajya Sabha, from wherever, from the ruling halls of everywhere. The teachers are very clever. So you have to go beyond your teachers and beyond your ancestors. So how do we do that? For as far as I'm concerned, the only way to do it is to try to plunge into the world. I wanted to know what fascism in Israel was like, but I was told by the Gandhian movement that you should go to Israel in order to see how wonderful it is because they all live together in intentional community in the kibbutz. So I went. And it was wonderful. In the kibbutz, you got up at four in the morning and you did the chatzalim, the, you know, you did the fish, you did the vegetables, and so on and so on. And all the people in Quetzal Geva came from Eastern Europe. They all felt they were socialists. And then I happened in on a Palestinian wedding. I happened to speak to some Kerala Jews, and the narratives were different. Then I read others like Ilan Pape and Uri Davis, who were all Sabre and Jew, you know, Israeli born. The story shifted. So who were my teachers? Were they the Gandhian gurus of Vinoba, with whom I walked for several years? Or how? So how do we do this stuff? How do we get this stuff out of our heads? What are our principles? And how do we figure out what these principles are? Because it would seem to me, as a Brahmin, that the criteria of Brahminism itself has to be destroyed and changed. Of Harvard, of Boston, Amherst University have to be changed in order for us to cre create another world. But I'm going to stop there for the moment. There's plenty more and so on. And I thought what would be great is if we could read a couple of these poems. You know, the uh, Westerners are always coming to India because it's a great civilization, right? So people want to come. I don't mean just the Taj Mahal, but anything else. I mean, all those great buildings. Or at least they want to go to see the wall in Zimbabwe or something, or the pyramids of Egypt or whatever. So I thought you'd like to read Bertolt Brecht's poem. Question from a worker who reads. And then we'll go on to the others. Is that okay? Do I, we still have time to do some of this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Somebody want to read it for me? Thank you. Great Rome is full of triumphal arches. Who erected them? 
over whom did the Caesar tri Caesar's triumph? You like it? Yeah. Well, it's been translated. So I won't read it out to you, but I'll pass it around. But it's been translated. And uh, guess what language this is in? OK? I'll pass it around. And it's one of your group that's translated it. How about reading the Ballad of the Landlord? You gotta read with rhythm if you don't read nice and music. Yeah. <laughs> what are you claiming some nationalism in Langston Hughes? Uh huh. We need to talk about nationalism. Uh huh. I know. Lou, we talked about this over the phone too some like years did. ago. Yeah. You asked me a lot of questions. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> right. I'll do it. I'll try. You're not going to get, let the sister have, uh, why don't you do half and half? Well, we go back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah go back and forth. Yeah, go first. You go the first one. Landlord, landlord, my roof has sprung a leak. Don't you remember I told you about it way last week? Landlord, landlord, your steps is broken down. When you come up yourself, it's a wonder you don't fall down. Ten bucks you say I owe you? Ten bucks you say is due? Well, that's ten bucks more I'll pay you till you fix this house up new. What? You're going to give a bitch... Get eviction orders, you're gonna cut off my heat? You're gonna take my furniture and throw it in the street? Mm-hmm, you talking high and mighty. Talk on till you get through. You ain't gonna be able to say a word if I land my fist on you. Police, police, come and get this man. He's trying to ruin the government, overturn the land. Copper's whistle, patrol bell, arrest. Precinct, precinct station, iron cell, headlines and press. Man threatens landlord, tenant held bail. Judge gives Negro 90 days in county jail. <laughs> and a worker's speech to a doctor. This is what I usually give as the first reading for my public health classes, so you can start this off. Who wants to read this? A doctor in the house? <laughs> To read it? I'll read it. Yes, please. Thank you. We know what makes us ill. When we're ill, word says you're the one to make us well for 10 years. So we hear you learned how to heal an elegant school built at the people's expense and to get your knowledge to dispense the fortune that means you can make us well. Can you make us well? When we visit you, our clothes are ripped and torn and you listen all over our naked body. As to the cause of our illness, a glance at our rags would be more revealing. <laughs> One and the same cause wears out our bodies and our clothes. The pain in our shoulder comes, you say, from the damp. And this is also the cause of the patch on the apartment wall. So tell us then, where does the damp come from? Too much work and too little food make us weak and scrawny. Your prescription says, put on more weight. You might as well tell a fish go climb a tree. How much time can you give us? We see. One carpet in your flat costs the fees you take from 5,000 consultations. You'll no doubt protest your innocence. The damp patch on the wall of our apartments tells the same story. Something, isn't it? <laughs> Breathe for a minute, yeah, all right? So, given our time limitations, perhaps you have comments. And, and you know, I'm so old, I'm uninsultable. <laughs> you can try insulting me, but you won't succeed. So raise whatever voice you wish to raise. And don't complain if you get as good back. Who 
terms of adopting the very beginning of the of our conversation, uh, I'm just interested in knowing uh, a little bit more about counter narrative. Can you speak a little bit more about Qatar's work in South Africa? I know there was a movement about uh, creating a new type of currency. I don't know if you, if you can talk a little bit about that or just about Qatar's story. Actually, there's a great deal that we have to talk about with that and a great deal to be said. And there is, um, it's important, I think, if, you, if you're interested to really delve into that history, and it's available. Um, and it's impossible, Im, important, and that's the nationalism piece. Uh, how can I, s let me just say one or two sentences to just then give you the clue so you can go ahead and investigate for yourself and we can co-investigate as we go along outside of this. But was Gaddafi a socialist? Or he, you know, that is not the question here, right? We can talk about that as well. But certainly, he was one of the bridges, very important bridges between the Arab part of uh, the mother continent, our mother continent since we all came out of old Dubai. Yes? <laughs> so, and the fact that, and this is Sherif, uh, Sherif has written a wonderful book on the uh, East African slave trade between East Africa and the fig plantations of uh, Arabia. So that's one thing for you to look at. So the kind of uh, discomfort, enmity, supremacy, racism that existed came to the full force, of course, the British used that to divide and rule. But that also infected the relationships when Mother Africa became increasingly independent, so to speak. It's not liberation, but it's independent from colonial, the colonial yoke. So in that sense, nationalism becomes a very important uh, ideological position the love of one's people, the love of one's, even though the uh, boundaries were drawn by the masters uh, who wanted to divide up the African cake. So you have to be complex about this, right? So even that, even though there was a Libya, what is Libya? I mean, what does that mean? You know, it's Hannibal, elephants, what? No, what? Carthage, Babylon, you know? So you have to keep going back uh, to be able to understand that. However, in the 20th century, when we had a Gaddafi or we had any of the other great nationalist leaders who said, we don't want this particular yoke on our necks anymore, and Gaddafi was such a person. And the o Organization of African Unity, OAU, was a very important uh, organization of bringing together uh, this kind of commitment and battles and liberation movements. And in order to do that, one needed resources, assets, as they call them in the Pentagon, but anyway, guns. So we're talking about some very serious stuff. And of course, within this, somebody like uh, in the Congo, Roberto um, Holden, got his money from the CIA. Savimbi afterwards got his money from the CIA. But Gaddafi was a source because of the oil for the other side. And that was very important. And so who was he? He was many things. You know? If you and I met him now, would we be, and the, and the end piece of his death, which is on, I, I, I can't bear to see it, you know? The way the Americans killed him, American ruling class killed him, you know, was something else. But Gaddafi, was a nationalist, but he also betrayed the people. He also enriched himself. He was a misogynist. What? Yes. But we have to ask ourselves the question, what is the main contradiction and what is the main aspect of the contradiction at this particular time? And that's what we have to ask ourselves now when we talk about uh, Black Lives Matter, black, you know, the flag. We're going to raise it in Brattleboro in a couple of days, so it's, it's, it's on my mind. 
But then what are the contradictions? There are many contradictions in this too. What is the primary one? What is the fundamental one? What is the social reality? And Gaddafi, for a time, had very correct answers to those which benefited the people of Africa. And the people who were in East Timor, for example, who gained encouragement from this. It's a very peculiar business, you know, because it's not all uh, very simple and straight. You know, it's not like we're standing in this cruddy place and most of us intellectuals want to uh, step to another beautiful, pristine place without dirtying ourselves. It doesn't work like this, at least in my opinion, right? So it's now, you know, we have a big campaign on, please join us, in asking Bernie Sanders to go to Gaza. Go to Gaza, you know? You said that there's a humanitarian crisis, not a humanitarian crisis, but anyway, a horrific situation. So go to Gaza. So it's in that kind of talk that Gaddafi helped with money, with assets, with thinking, with himself, uh, that particular time in the 60s, in the late 50s. And there are lots of reading one can do. I hope that's useful. Of course it does. I mean, that's central to all our lives, right? Um, well, I meant something very simple, that when I was young, when I was little, I just thought life would go on and on and on and on you know, forever. <laughs> and at 77, I think, okay, five more, six more, seven more years, got to pedal faster, you know, I got to do more stuff, come on, you know. Chomsky's words, do more do better, I want to bop him one, you know, because it's like, <laughs> whatever. So, and, you know, he's got this famous saying, the species is fucked, right? Excuse me for the young ones who are uh, not used to curse words. But anyway, um, and I get mad at him about that too because he's so old and he's saying, okay, I'm going to die soon and take you all with me. You know, it doesn't work. So it doesn't work for me. So I think that all of us actually know more and better than we do. We hide from ourselves too. And the bourgeoisie has taught us how to be hidden from ourselves and how to comfort ourselves. Uh, use the oxygen mask first, you know, or whatever, or, you know all of that kind of stuff, if you know what I mean. I'm very impatient with that kind of thinking because, um, you know, take care of yourself. Uh, yes, 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 okay, but what else? You know. So I was very, very lucky. I mean, I was in a different contextual time of the Second World War, the British Raj, and all coming to an end. So at that time, there was a big voice, uh, and that was Gandhi's voice, right? It could have been Sebastian Bose, it could be a number of people, it could be Ambedkar, it could be anybody else. But it happened in my particular case, there was this particular voice that my parents were involved in in the school and so on. So there's a whole milieu of telling me, you should be like this. You should not be like this. Don't cross your legs like that. That's futile, yes, but Think about the other children. You know. So when I had my four-year-old in Angola in the Gaya camp, he ate with the children, it was once a day, right? 
he's a little black boy from Philadelphia. What? Yes. You mix it up. Somebody says that, right? You mix it up. You know, it's mix it up. So in that sense, you have it right in front of you to have those choices. You want to find out. Go plunge into it, right? The India-China war was going on. And so the couple of people called out and said, let's go marching from Delhi to the Burma border. So we sold everything we had and went on it, because that seemed the right thing to do. But it was not nationalist, because we had read enough about China. We were on the Chinese side, because the Indian side had been, and the CIA wrote a similar thing, had really provoked that war. And I say this in India. Now it's more difficult to say it in India, because the rising fascism in India follows the rising fascism of the ruling classes of the world. It's no different. But you plunge into it because what is life about, right? Get on with it, you know, that type of thing. But however, it's not so easy because when you're young, uh, there are other juices flowing in the body, right? Of, of hope and, oh, you know, fulfillment of sexuality, of the color of your hair, whatever. <laughs> Right? So, um, fair enough. But if there's something driving you, my old friend Joan Hinton in China used to say, uh, has that person been bitten yet? You know? <laughs> Have they been grabbed yet? So if something grabs you which has to do with the people, then nothing can stop it, you know? Actually. And then it becomes quite nice to sort of say, yeah, we want this to be better. You want this to be different. Who wants all this crap that's been going on still? And then you don't get afraid anymore. You know, you, it's, not, it's not fear, right? What am I afraid of? I'm afraid of death, because I don't want to die before I see what's happened next. You know. But um, of being disabled so that I can't work, and energy, all of that kind of stuff. Fair enough. I know that's why I'm nice to young people, because they'll take care of me. <laughs> but, but the point is that, that that energy, for me at least, is fantastic. I go into a classroom of sixth graders, fifth graders, four, three, two, one, whatever, with my, you know, and I say, can I be your grandmother? Uh, oh, that's, the, that's what I'll get. So I said, really? Why not? Well, I've already got a grandmother. Well, can I be one, to, you know? But if I go to the Indian school and I say, can I be your grandmother, what would they say? Yes, because the feudal communal stuff of the basic production and its superstructure will give rise to that answer. But not here, which is different from the Protestant ethic and individuality and be afraid of the stranger, right? So, you know, we have all of that to deal with. So that's fantastic, let's deal with that. And uh, the other question is, can I, when I'm walking on the street, will you tell me if my shoes are untied? No. Uh, yes. Why would you tell me? We don't want you to fall. We don't want you to fall. How great is that? You know? So if one keeps that, those juices in one's head, then it will provide you with the stuff to plunge. I promise. Namaskar, Ma. So, anyway. Anybody else? One last comment, thought? No? Thank you so much. Thank you.